When we think about investments, we always like to start by thinking where we are in the investment cycle. Over the last 15 months, we've seen a very strong response from authorities to try to help economies recover from the pandemic. Their ability to act has, of course, been helped by the fact that essentially no one is to blame. Policy measures worked first via a sharp decline in interest rates and subsequently through increased fiscal spending, particularly uh, from developed world governments. Economic momentum was strong in the latter part of 2020 and has continued uh, through the first and second quarters of 2021. In fact, global growth rate expectations for this year have now increased to around about 6%. But we now have a strange situation where we have strong growth, albeit off a low base, at the same time that we have very intense stimulus measures in place. This is a combination that isn't really sustainable. The primary story for the second quarter of the year has been inflation, which is natural given all of the stimulus in the global economy. The base is low, so the numbers do look high, but the base is picking up and we've seen some quite high inflation prints out of the United States. Policymakers for now are viewing this as transitory and accordingly are not adjusting monetary policy just yet. When we think about whether inflation will be transient or sticky, we certainly see a number of transient elements. First, of course, is that as the United States economy has opened up uh, through this year, so we've seen dramatic increase in demand for both flights and accommodation, allowing companies that provide these services to lift their prices, which then flows through to the inflation numbers. Among the other transitory impacts, we've seen the global chip shortage have an impact on many different businesses, but particularly on new vehicles. Uh, which has interestingly played through to rapid price increases for second-hand vehicles. In our view, these impacts are temporary and the environment should normalize as businesses catch up and consumers adapt back to a post-pandemic world. What we must remember is that global supply chains were designed for a certain mix of spend from consumers and they'll take a little bit of time to adjust to this uh, in the post-pandemic world but we do believe that they will get that right over the coming months. One clear example of the transitory nature is the way US lumber prices more than tripled from pre-pandemic levels uh, until around about uh, early May this year, as people spent more time on home renovations and of course more money as well. What we've seen though is a fantastic example of Adam Smith's classic invisible hand, where high prices both encouraged supply and put a lid on demand, resulting in quite a rapid price decrease over the last six or eight weeks. And really now lumber prices are quite close uh, to being back to pre-pandemic levels. A number of other commodity prices, like copper and oil, have started to roll over over the last uh, few weeks, which should ease some of the pressure on inflation. We are, however, starting to see some pressure come through in labor markets. While high US inflation is not our base case, we do expect it over the next decade to be higher than it was over the 10 years preceding the pandemic. We do have plans in place for how to position our portfolios should inflation surprise to the upside. Through the second quarter, we saw the EU start to catch up with the US in terms of GDP growth, likely driven by the rapid increase in vaccinations in that area. At the start of the quarter, only around 12% of Europeans had been vaccinated compared to about 30% of Americans. Yet by the end of the quarter, both areas had around about 60% of their populations having received at least one uh, jab. This has then seen the opening of sports events uh, around the world, which is uh, certainly, I think, a very positive sign for economies returning back to normal. Economic momentum is strong, but it's clearly slowing from the very high levels that we saw in the earlier parts of the pandemic, just given at the low base previously. Our expectations remain for strong economic activity through the rest of the year. This should then support company earnings and consequently equity markets. We do, however, know that at some stage, all of this economic stimulus will have to be removed. Firstly, via a tapering of government bond purchases uh, or the reduction in the so-called quantitative easing, and subsequently uh, via higher interest rates. As always, the monetary authorities will have to balance trying to cool the economy down without pushing so hard that it falls into recession. So we must then ask what all of this actually means for portfolio positioning. If we start with global bonds, we've continually argued over the last year and a half and longer 
that government bond yields are currently very low and thus the balance of probabilities is that they will rise. That of course means that our expectations for returns from global bonds are quite low. On top of that, if inflation proves to be more persistent than the base case, investors may even see a reduction in their capital uh, from investments in global bonds. This is why we've had very low exposure to global government bonds in our multi-asset portfolios and we remain comfortable with our material underweight position towards this asset class. The problem for investors, of course, is that cash is essentially yielding zero return as well. It does, of course, provide one with a degree of optionality and does protect one's capital, but it is not the long-term solution. This then leads us to our view on global equities, where we've been quite positive for the last 15 months or so. We also believe that the South African market in general should remain quite correlated with global markets. The key risk to equity markets remains that if and when inflation increases and global bond yields rise, this will then have an impact on the equity markets and put a break on valuations. We must remember that asset classes are priced relative to one another. So as bond yields rise, that then lifts the required return that investors will demand for taking on equity market risk. Higher required returns mean that the price to earnings multiple that the market trades on should come under some sort of pressure. Remember though, this can come from one of two sources, either higher earnings or lower prices, or of course some combination.